Justice is getting what you deserve and not getting what you do not deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. And so what we want in our justice system is for the punishment to fit the crime. Andy Bashir is in a gubernatorial race and he is fighting to once again be the governor of Kentucky. And this decision he made all the way back in 2020 is now coming back to absolutely haunt him. Let's look at the reporting. Majority of Kentucky inmates released by governor's COVID commutations committed felonies. It goes on to say nearly 70% of all inmates released by Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir through commutations during the coronavirus pandemic went on to reoffend, with some committing violent felonies like assault and even homicide. Wow. 1,700 criminals let out due to the spread of COVID. And this was early 2020. So, you know, we try to have the most nuanced view. No one knew what this was. They were saying like millions or tens of millions of people were going to die from this. We had no idea what to do with it or how serious it was. And it was going through prisons because it's these isolated populations, kind of like it went through nursing homes, these places where people are in close proximity to one another and they were worried about it. And so the answer was, let's let 1,700 of these people out early. Uh, let's commute their sentences. And so 70% have reoffended. The majority of those are felonies. And there's even at least one homicide. And so here's, here's the first thing to realize. Justice is getting what you deserve and not getting what you do not deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. And so what we want in our justice system is for the punishment to fit the crime. And all the way back to like the code of Hammurabi, like the, the one of the very first in the whole ancient world, thousands and thousands of years ago, written down governmental codes, understood the power of deterrence. And what happens when you begin to commute sentences is that just like the two teens who struck and fatally killed the bicyclist on purpose while live streaming it, the first thing they said when they got put in the cop car was, I'll be out in 30 days. We have a soft on crime uh, spreading ideology throughout the West and people are no longer deterred by the, the potential punishments. And when you commute 1700 people at a time, somewhere in the subconscious recesses of your mind, you go, well, you know, even if I do commit another crime, I'll probably get out early. I'm probably not serving my whole time. Let's go back to the reporting. It says the report produced by Kentucky's Department of Information and Technology Service found that of the 1,702 individuals whose sentences were commuted by Bashir in 2020, a majority of them, 882, went on not to jaywalk, not to get a speeding ticket, to commit felonies. An additional 252 committed misdemeanors, leaving just over 500 who committed no crimes. Bashir commuted criminal sentences through two distinct executive orders, both of which were examined in the report of those from April 3rd, 2020 release. 68% of individuals have had at least one criminal case, including at least a misdemeanor charge filed against them since release. The reoffending rate was nearly identical for those released on August 24th, 2020, with the report finding that 69% of individuals have had at least one criminal case including at least a misdemeanor charge filed against them. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see this chart, which shows the two different executive orders, uh, the new felonies that were committed in orange, the new misdemeanors committed in blue, the new other something that wasn't a misdemeanor or felony. And then this massive minority of people who have not got any new charges. This is obviously a miscarriage of justice. It was a miscalculation on the part of Andy Bashir, And it really shows how we can do things sometimes with the right intentions, but with the improper wisdom. And it can have disastrous effects. Someone lost their life. Others were assaulted. The majority of people released committed again, again, felonies, not not minor petty felonies. And all the way back to the ancient wisdom, we should have been able to anticipate this exact outcome. Number one, we just know psychologically and sociologically that the recidivism rate is so high. And recently I got to do some prison ministry for the first time. And it was amazing when we asked, how many of you is this not your first time? 
uh, the majority of the room raised their hand. The majority of people had been in there before and they were hoping and praying that this would be their last. And the other thing I found interesting with this group that I went in to do prison ministry with is that the likelihood of recidivism dropped massively if someone leaves prison and is willing to get into some kind of faith community. And we just know this. And I know a lot of people struggle with the idea of God. And a lot of Christians have presented a God that doesn't represent who God actually is, his nature or his character. And a lot of people have been hurt by organized religion. And a lot of people just have a lot of questions, very skeptical, maybe naturally. But what we see over and over again is that change in the most difficult circumstances often requires spiritual intervention. This is like the most successful addiction intervention in the world is the 12 steps. And it begins, it necessitates a belief in a higher power and the possibility of actual spiritual change in your life. And the recidivism rates also reflect this, that when there is spiritual change and when there is spiritual community around you, that is your greatest opportunity to get back to living the life that God created you to live. And it does no one any favors to allow them to escape the consequence of their actions. And anytime justice fails to be served, Someone somewhere will pay the price that was due. The person that was murdered by one of these released inmates, they paid a massive price. They paid the ultimate price for someone else's lack of justice in their sentence. In Psalm 89, 14, it says, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. I love that justice is put right alongside these other attributes of righteousness, love, and faithfulness. And it's specifically paired with righteousness. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of the throne of God, the foundation of a correct system, the foundation of how things are supposed to function. Justice and righteousness are like the 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 two sides of this foundation that uphold law and order and love and faithfulness. All the way back in the Levitical law, it says, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But again, in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Again, justice and righteousness. You cannot truly have one without the other. And the problem is Andy Bashir, I think, was trying to do something right something even potentially righteous in that situation. But you cannot be righteous if you are not upholding justice. And we should remember that even in our own lives. If you enjoyed this clip, make sure you check out the full podcast and subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all new content. You can also support the channel at patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. Link is in the description below.